Howdy you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, uh, what I'm gonna do is tell you uh, a little story, right? That, if you can believe it, will take us around the globe, or at least part of it. It doesn't really qualify for the full 360. In fact, it's barely 180. And if you'd like to have a goo at a new video every Tuesday and pretty much every Friday, please subscribe. It helps out, but you know, hey. Do what you like. In Cleveland lived the not-so-good Dr. Issa and his not-so-beloved wife, Rosemary. They seemed happy, don't they always? It's kind of a cliche in like true crime, but it turns out that nobody really knows anything, and if they do, good luck getting it out of them. Because Dr. Yazid Issa had a few secrets, right? And he'd be damned if he would stick around when those secrets, you know, came to light. Nah, nah. Couple of plane trips. Be grand. The old, you know, nah, 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 you can't get me until they did. Let's give it a go. This story takes us to Cleveland, Ohio. I don't think I really need to set the scene as I usually do, because I'm sure most of you probably know exactly you know what I'm talking about? So instead I'm going to talk to you about a road, right? Uh, Wilson Mills Road, if you can believe that. It's in Highland Heights City, Cuyahoga County, which is really part of the Northeast Greater Cleveland area, so don't worry too much about it. Wilson Mills Road bisects Highland Heights, and on it is uh, not much other than houses and um, trees. It's just really part of the suburbs, and uh, like most suburbs, it's like most suburbs. Copy and paste. The speed limit on this road is 35 miles an hour. But on the 24th of February 2005, a woman named Rosemary Issa, formerly known as Rosemary DiPuccio, was driving a hell of a lot slower than that. Rosemary was on her way to the, to the cinema, to the pictures, right, to catch a flick with her sister Diana. But she wouldn't make it. She would not make it because Rosie, she was not feeling too great at all. Rosie was married to a man named Yezid. Yaz, as he went by to his friends, and they lived in a beautiful home in suburban Cleveland. Rosie, a nurse, had met Yazid while working at a hospital in the city in 1995, later marrying in 1999. Rosie was born in October 1966, growing up with two brothers and one sister, and she would go on to have children herself with her husband. First their son Armand, then daughter Lena, and the loving family were planning on working on number three. Rosie was very close with her big Italian family, all was good. She enjoyed her work and was good at it. Debates, she'd be there, and she didn't keep her opinions to herself. Rosie always rooted, you know, for the underdog. And she was someone who cut quite a different figure uh, from her husband, Yazid. Yaz, the Yazman, Yazdog. Yazid Isa was born son of Palestinian immigrant parents. Growing up in Detroit, his parents owned a grocery store, and his education was the streets, until the entire family moved to Cleveland so Yazid could attend medical school. He started by studying anesthesiology before switching to the action, becoming an ER doctor. But I guess that just wasn't enough for him, because in 1996 he started with his brother, uh, they started a pager, pager company, right, they were thinking ahead. Uh, they started out in 1996, and then later on in 2001, they started Dish One Up Satellite, Incorporated. This again was with his brother Firas. However, uh, Yazid's business dealings, well, Rosie, she liked to shoot from the hip. You know, she was straight up. Yazid, nah, not really for him. He was already into the whole, you know, being honest in business. He was like. That's for suckers. He was a straight up liar, is what I'm trying to say. In 1998, uh, him and his brother were indicted for, like, fraud, for fraudulent business records, and for stealing. Now, his criminal record was expunged, so I don't think he did actually any time for it, but, um, well, more of that coming. He would also lose his medical license, as he was a big, he had a, he had a, he's a big fan, he had a thirst. He's a thirsty man, he always was a fan of a few sips. 
you know, with, with alcohol. And let me just go back to the satellite business for a second. It was run from an apartment. An apartment that Yaz, um, he had a secret bedroom in it that he used as his booty hotel. He'd often have women up there getting down and dirty. And this was, of course, while Rosie was at home, none the wiser. Interesting fella. And we haven't even started. In 2005, Yaz was 36 years old. Rosie, 38. And though he was a bit of a tricky dicky when it came to business, he had the big house, the car, the pool, he was the provider. Whatever they needed, they got. And whatever Yaz needed, he got. Or would take. He was a flashy guy. He wanted you to know when he was around. And he was a showman. He'd become an even bigger one than he could ever imagine. So let's steer the ship back to Wilson Mills Road. Rosie was driving down that road in her Volvo SUV. It was only a 10 minute drive from her home to the pictures. But as she drove down, she slowed and then she began veering all over the place. At one point, her car actually hit another car. But eventually, as it was veering, it slowed and came to a stop. It just so happened that a medical practitioner was driving by. She pulled over and ran to the car to see if the driver, Rosie, was okay. She was obviously having some difficulty. Rosie was limp in the driver's seat and vomiting all over herself, desperately struggling to breathe. First responders arrived soon after on that winter afternoon. She was raced to the ER. The doctors, they tried to do everything they could. Even Yaz, a former doctor himself, was there by her bedside. But after an hour, Rosemary was gone. Her family devastated. Her brother, though, got a call later, uh, later that night. It was a friend of Rosie's, a friend named Eve, and it turned out that while Rosie was driving that day, Rosie had called this friend from the car, and she had something to say. Over the phone, Rosie said that as she was leaving the house that day, Yaz came up to her and gave her a capsule. Uh, a, a, what he said was a calcium capsule. She took it, popped in the car, started emptying the tank. But after a few minutes, ooh, stomach's at me, nauseous. She started, started feeling sick like she was gonna puke her ring up. She called and told all this to Eva, and next thing you know, Rosie was dead. And now Eva was telling this to Rosie's family. Maybe there was something wrong with the pill. Maybe he hadn't given her the right one uh, by accident, but that's something you might want to take a look at. And the main thing Eva had said was, please, please get some kind of toxicology report. And I mean, Rosie's family were dumbfounded. They loved Yaz, couldn't imagine he would intentionally hurt his wife. And if unintentionally, he would be devastated. He already was devastated, to be fair. So devastated, he remained distant from the Dipuccios. And I just uh, think we got a beautiful future together. Didn't want to talk to them. And he'd already began letting people know that Rosie was dead. Now, obviously, he was in a bit of a mood. Uh, you know yourself. So, he didn't really want to write an essay. Here, I'm just... Clackety, clackety. Here, listen. This is the crack. Just wanted to let you know that Rosie died yesterday in a minor car accident. She will be missed. Lol. Okay, he didn't write that. And then he hit send all. Right, oh, well, another job well done. <sighs> Moving on. They needed to determine how she died. After all, something had killed her and no one knew what. Not the cops, the doctors, whatever. So the coroner did his job. However, cause of death, after he had a looky see, was still unknown. And the toxicology report would, uh, would take some time. And there was an investigation that needed to be done to make sure, you know, that... Well, to find out what it was. Listen up. So worry about that calcium tablet uh, that Yaz had given Rosie. It eventually reached the cops and they were like, well, you know, we should probably just ask, you know, what that was. Because, uh, you know, she takes a pill, she feels sick, she dies. So they thought they would ask uh, him about that, you know. Tell me this, what was that? She wanted to go see a movie with her sister. She was running a little late and she left around one. It was five. But everything was normal. And the next thing I know, I didn't talk to you guys, but nobody. Saying that she was in a car accident and not to. She's having a good. Is she taking any uh, over the counter meds or vitamins or supplements? She was taking 
a vitamin occasionally, and I've been told Rosie to try to take a calcium supplement. And then, uh, right before she left, she took the calcium supplement to take it. Just calcium. I can't see how I would relate with anything. When did she start taking the vitamins? Prenatal vitamins? Are they thinking, I mean, any of this had to do with anything? I don't, we don't know. I mean, at this yeah. point, they have somebody who's 38 years old. Oh, I know. <laughs> Suddenly she, she dies and nobody can help her. It's, it's kind of like, what happened? Well, I think I have most of what I need uh, at this point. Are there calcium pills that still at home? Mm -hmm. Would you mind if I followed you back to your home and collected those? No, that'd be great. Not at all? Okay. Anything else you can think of that I've thought of everything? So Detective followed Yaz home, and upon entering the house, he found two honeys inside. Two nannies, one for the day, one for the night. Why you would need a nighttime nanny? Their names were Margarita Montanez and Michelle Madeline. Though they were really nannies for Yaz and his dick. Yaz gave the officer the pills from the medicine cabinet, and they were to be tested. Then, later on that same night in the middle of March, Rather than one of his nannies watching the kids, he asked Rosie's sister to, and he dropped off his two children at her house. And then, in the middle of the night, he called and said his brother had been in a car accident. He'd have to head off for a day or two. He never came back. The Nipuccios learned quickly that there had been no car accident. A missing persons report was filed for Yazid. A Yazid who was long gone. He was, by this stage, halfway across the world, in Cyprus. And, just a little while after, they learned the calcium capsules were in fact filled with cyanide. In fact, it was readily apparent when they were viewed by the uh, technician. See, there was a mix in that little box. Some of the capsules were filled with a fine white powder, which was calcium. Others were filled with this, these little crystals. That was cyanide. An arrest warrant was filed for Yaz for first degree murder, and an international manhunt began. The quickest way from the Issa home to the cinema was um, was was taking the the highway the entire way the entire way there, right? Not going down Wilson Mills Road. That would actually be a detour. Yaz had not been counting on that, that Rosie would take that road. A road with a slower speed limit. His plan was to poison his wife with cyanide. And if she was to take the highway, like he thought she would, she would be driving 60-ish miles an hour. By the time the cyanide kicked in, she would have crashed at high speed. No need for a toxicology report or worries about pills. Cause of death, car accident. Good chance, by the way, that if she did crash on the highway, she probably could have injured or killed someone else too. Hard to imagine that didn't cross Yaz's mind. That's fucking cold. If that had happened, Yaz would have been free to have his mistresses over. A real hound dog, this guy. And it seems that's what he wanted. A life free to do whatever the frick he wanted. Drinking, fucking around. Sure, he hired his mistresses to be his nannies. This is like that Dr. Martin McNeil all over again. He hires his mistress to be his nanny. Gambling and the old ball and chain cut loose. No divorce, no money bullshit. He didn't give a shite about anyone other than himself. So what's a murder? He hadn't counted on Rosie taking the slower road where the car would just stop and then her body could be examined. And he also hadn't counted on Rosie telling anyone you know, that she had just taken a pill. So, when the police asked for them, he panicked. He had a big party that night, and then he drove to Detroit and blew 50 grand at the MGM Grand Detroit Casino. And then he got on a plane. Cyprus does have an extradition treaty with the USA. And Yaz must have figured that out too, because he didn't stay there. He later moved to Lebanon, which does not have an extradition treaty. He also had a friend there who could make connections to get him set up 
with a new life. The FBI learned of this three months later, and there was nothing to be done other than, other than making pleas for him to come home. So what we're doing today is making a plea to Yazid, um, if he is watching, to come back to Cleveland and answer to the charges before him. So, like, what was he up to in, in Lebanon? Maybe he was having a fucking great time. He was hitting it up in the discos, Flandering. Uh, he changed his name. He changed his name to Maurice Khalife. He got glasses and a goatee. Looking sharp, a new man. He also didn't keep it to himself that he was an alleged, at this point, killer. You'd even joke about it all the time. Hey, guess what? I killed my wife. He got a new email address that was literally fugitive at hotmail.com. That's how you can really tell this story takes place in like the early 2000s. He was using Hotmail. And literally the only thing the authorities could do was wait for him to leave the country. And I don't know much about Lebanon. Maybe it's, it's really, really cool and you don't want to leave ever, so they can't get you. But uh, leave he did after a year and a half. He went back to uh, he went back to Cyprus, if you can believe that. And he was immediately arrested, getting off the plane. However, Cyprus won't extradite you if the case you're involved in the death penalty the death penalty could be involved. If the death penalty is, could be involved, Cyprus won't send you back. So the county prosecutor back all the way in Ohio said no, no. Of course not, there's no death penalty here. Yazid's attorneys fought for three years. He was in an airport jail for three years while this went on, and they were fighting to have him extradited. At which point the county prosecutor said, yes, okay, seriously, I will actually take the death penalty off the cards. Just bring him back, please. And he went back to face his first degree murder charge. The trial began in January 2010. There was no good testimony in Yaz's defense, uh, but the defense aimed for well, it was all uh, circumstantial. There was a poison pill bottle, and there was him leaving the country. How do we know, you know, the thing that we, uh, know? You know, uh, there was a bottle with cyanide pills in it. Rosemary said he had given her a tablet. She was later found to have died of cyanide poisoning, and he fled the country. But how can you connect all this together? The state's case here is entirely circumstantial in nature and you will, or said another way, there is no hard evidence, no physical evidence, no scientific evidence whatsoever to connect Isidisa to this crime. Well, they said no forensics had been taken on the pill bottle, no uh, fingerprints, nothing like that. Someone else could have put the cyanide into those capsules and Yaz didn't have a clue. They did not execute any search warrants at Margarita's home. You will hear that they made no effort or very little effort to investigate her as a suspect in this case. He just fled the country because he wanted to go on a holiday. And some of the people who testified against him, his brother, the guy who took him in in Lebanon, they cut a deal with the prosecutors because, because they helped him. So the defense could pick them apart. What if one of his mistresses wanted Yaz for themselves? He was happily married and they put the cyanide in the capsules. The prosecution on the other hand had, uh, well, everything else, including the fact that he bragged the shit about murdering Rosie while in Lebanon. On April 20th, 2005, the Cuyahoga County coroner ruled that Rosemary Issa died as a result of acute cyanide intoxication. When this tragedy was announced, this 38-year-old mother of two had been in her grave for nearly two months. Meanwhile, her husband had fled this country and had started, had fled this country over a month earlier and had started a new life in Beirut, Lebanon, living as Maurice Khalifi. Who, the children, four-year-old Armand and two-year-old Lena, had been orphaned by their mother's death and had been abandoned by their father who had disappeared with no good reason or justification. Rosemary Issa left that morning or that afternoon and prior to her leaving, the defendant insisted that she take one of these tablets. Insisted that she take the tablet. Not that she take it sometime later or when it's more convenient for you, but before you go out the house to go to the movie that you're in a hurry for, let me delay you a little bit to, so that I can give you this tablet. So plan A is high speed automobile accident, plan B is random product tampering, plan C is the girlfriend killed my wife so she could be with me. 
That's the presentation you're going to get in this case. The jury would come back with a guilty verdict. We, the jury in this case, being duly impaneled and sworn, do find the defendant, Yazid Issa, guilty of aggravated murder in violation of 2903.01a of the revised code. Juror number one, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number two? Yes. Juror number three? Yes. Juror number four? Yes. Juror number five? Yes. Juror number six? Yes. Juror number seven? Yes. Juror number eight? And he was sentenced to life with no parole for 20 years. To the defendant, I have thought over the last few days of what to say to you, and honestly, you have so little respect for women that I doubt that anything that I could possibly say to you would make any difference to you at all. And so I certainly agree with Dominic and with Rocco and certainly with Julie. The DiPuccio said everything that I could ever say to you and more, uh, and there is very little uh, I think that I could say it would be a waste of my breath. I regret that you have the benefit of uh, committing this crime uh, under the old law, and so the only sentence that I can give to you is the one by law. That is it. I have no other choice. But you took it, an oath as a doctor. I cannot imagine the evil that you have done to these people, especially your children. It is my great hope and the only hope that I can think of at this moment that they forget you. They forget you. The jurors said something interesting to me. Uh, after the conclusion of this case, they said that they felt like you were the character in The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. They felt like your actions were just like that. And that keeping that uh, bottle of calcium or cyanide was your way uh, of that heart beating. I am so glad that you will be leaving my courtroom now and that I hopefully will never have to look upon you again. And Shanae, that is the end of that one. Yazid was a man who had it all, and he wanted more insatiable, um, and pretty much, like, everyone else, be damned. You know, we actually got the cyanide from eBay, if you can believe that crazy world we live in where you can just get such a dangerous poison online that will kill you in a couple of minutes. Probably shouldn't have said that. Don't look it up. Yeah, this dude sucks. Tragic story, but uh, good riddance to bad rubbish. He kind of looked killery, which is always fun. Uh, one of those guys, you, you know, when you see me go, oh yeah, that does make sense. Later, Yazdog. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this whole video. Um, or found it interesting at least, hey. Um, again, please subscribe if you want to see a new video every Tuesday and pretty much every Friday. I would say every Friday, but it's not every Friday because sometimes I take breaks. So almost every Friday. Um, and yeah, here, if you want to get like early access videos and some other bonus content ad free, check out Patreon and you can check out some merch down below. Uh, new t-shirts will be added soon, including one that's been already requested, so, uh, I'll let you know when it's up there. Until then, though, please, as always, take care of each other and yourselves. Because I love you. My count.